I'm Pete Daly, CEO and publisher of the U.S. Naval Institute, and I welcome you to a special event and discussion with General Martin E. Dempsey, U.S. Army, who served as the 18th Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. We're very pleased to be working in partnership with the Admiral James M. Loy Institute for Leadership at the Coast Guard Academy once again in bringing this event to the full Corps of Cadets, the staff, the faculty, as well as Naval Institute members and supporters. This year, we're honored to have General Dempsey as our special guest, taking part in a conversation with Admiral Thad Allen. Admiral Allen served as the 23rd Commandant of the Coast Guard and currently serves as the Dr. James S. Tyler Distinguished Chair at the Loy Institute. Welcome, Admiral Allen, and thank you. We thank the William M. Wood Foundation for their support and making this event possible, and we're deeply grateful for their sponsorship, enabling the Naval Institute to bring this professional development opportunity to the Corps of Cadets and the larger audience of our members and supporters. The Naval Institute has a very long and proud history of conducting essay contests, and I congratulate our three essay award winners of the Naval Institute's 2019 Coast Guard Essay Contest. Congratulations to our third prize winner, Petty Officer Third Class, Merrill McGowan. Our second prize winner, Lieutenant Commander Daniel Wiltshire, and our first prize winner, Lieutenant Andrew Ray. They dared to think and dared to write and submit their essays, and we recognize their achievement as top prize winners. We're excited to share some brief remarks from each award winner, and then over to you, Admiral Allen, to kick off what will no doubt be an outstanding discussion with General Dempsey. Thank you all for joining us, and I hope you enjoy the discussion. Greetings, Admiral Allen, General Dempsey, esteemed Naval Institute and Coast Guard Academy staff, cadets, and shipmates. I am OS3 Merrill McGowan from Sector San Francisco, and I would first like to extend my gratitude for the opportunity to speak on this platform. As a third class petty officer, the gravity of this chance does not go unnoticed or unappreciated. The Naval Institute is a bastion of opportunity, knowledge, collaboration, and a commitment to ensuring the United States will always have the best Coast Guard, Navy, and Marine Corps. At first, I was struck by the transformative nature of the prompt. Advancing new thought about the Coast Guard's relationship to power competition could be monumental. It provides a means to effect meaningful changes to the Coast Guard. My idea is to create patrol forces Indo-Pacific delegated to train our allies to create both the float and ashore models of our service that best fits their needs to protect their sovereignty. As China's increasing reach offers a looming threat to maritime safety, security, and stewardship throughout the region, we must offer our partnership. Gone are the days of a global peace known as a Pax Americana dependent on our seat as world police. We must now strive for a Pax Universalis reliant upon partnerships and seeking a better world. Capitalizing on our allegiances, we can make good on our promise to a free and open Indo-Pacific. I hope that the essay I wrote would stir new conversations regarding our international relationship in a contested and contentious region. The quicker that we can realize our old playbook needs to be re-examined, the quicker that we can foster lasting relationships that no other seagoing service can. Ultimately, I cannot emphasize enough the opportunities the Naval Institute affords us all. Rank aside, your voice can be heard. Writing is a great equalizer. And if you want to bring about change to better our service, the Naval Institute provides a platform for exactly that. I'm a third class petty officer and through writing, I have the opportunity to speak to everyone here. Use the available platforms we have to shed light on your ideas. We will better ourselves and our service. Thank you. Hi, I'm Lieutenant Commander Dan Wiltshire and my essay is entitled Send in the Coast Guard with the Marines. In it, I discuss how Coast Guard patrol boats will be key in supporting Marine Corps operations in a future war with China. I chose this topic after reading the Marine Corps' Force Design 2030 plan, which charts a bold course for how the Corps must adapt in order to win a war in the Pacific. The plan describes the vital need for small ships able to operate under fire, near islands, and disperse over a large area with a high degree of autonomy. And this really struck me as a demand signal for core Coast Guard competencies and capabilities. So in my essay, 
I write that the fast response cutter is well suited to Pacific combat because of its long range and untapped potential to carry advanced weapons and unmanned systems. I also argue that the Coast Guard has the right people with the right experience to support the Marines. War in the Pacific means fighting in the littoral areas around islands, which is really just another way of saying fighting near the coast. Many Coasties spend their careers honing coastal piloting skills while conducting everyday law enforcement and search and rescue. These navigation skills will be vital in Pacific Island combat, particularly once GPS is degraded or denied. Moreover, we're experts in maritime interdiction, and we excel at distinguishing innocent from nefarious vessel traffic. And those are skills that take years to master and that translate directly to combat operations in crowded coastal waters. I conclude that patrol boats should be based forward, in harm's way, alongside Marines at mobile expeditionary bases. Now, I wrote this essay to call attention to the Coast Guard's unique role in great power conflict. If history is a guide, the next war will occur in the Pacific and quite possibly during the active duty careers of today's cadets. In the Coast Guard, it's our job to remain always ready. And when it comes to the next Pacific War, that means being ready to support the joint force downrange with those unique skills and capabilities that only the Coast Guard can provide. When it comes to the value of professional writing, I believe that spilled ink in peacetime prevents spilled blood in war. And that's equally true whether on a battlefield or on a search and rescue case. The discourse facilitated by forums like the Naval Institute fosters the innovation needed to succeed in both war and peace. Finally, my advice to those considering professional writing is to remember that good ideas don't have pay grades, and it is never too early in your career to start writing. Thank you. Hi, I'm Lieutenant Andrew Ray, author of Employee Coast Guard Leaders in the Indo-Pacific, winner of the 2020 Coast Guard Essay Contest sponsored by the United States Naval Institute. When I wrote my essay, I was serving as the Operations Officer at Tactical Law Enforcement Team Pacific located in San Diego, California. Tactical Pacific is the parent command to 10 law enforcement detachments, also known as LEADETs, that deploy worldwide primarily in support of drug interdiction, defense readiness, and maritime law enforcement operations. Part of my job as ops was to find additional employment for our lead ads that supported Coast Guard strategic objectives. In my essay, I argue that Coast Guard and Department of Defense commanders should employ Coast Guard lead ads in the Indo-Pacific to support a myriad of maritime missions and ensure that the United States remains a peerless competitor in the area of great power competition. I hope my essay has increased people's knowledge on tacklets, broadened their perspectives on the value of lead ads, and started a conversation by senior leaders regarding their employment in the Indo-Pacific. The importance of writing cannot be overstated, and the United States Naval Institute and Proceedings offer a tremendous platform for sea service members to express their ideas that may very well be controversial and ignite a conversation that may impact future joint and combined operations. My advice to other Coast Guard men and women regarding professional writing is simple. First, do your homework, find your sources, and read, read, and reread all of your references. Second, Ensure that your paper, article, or essay is peer-reviewed. I'm exceptionally grateful to all of those that read my drafts and poked holes and challenged my arguments as it certainly made my essay stronger. Thank you. Good evening. It's my extraordinary pleasure uh, to be here this evening with uh, General Marty Dempsey, former chairman of the Joint Staff, uh, for a conversation uh, with and for and about the Corps of Cadets and some of General Dempsey's uh, recent work. Uh, based First of all, on his book, Radical Inclusion, which we highly recommend, and his autobiography and memoir, No Time for Spectators. Marty, it's great to have you with us this evening. It's good to be back with you, Thad. It's been a while, but, um, you know, just like a good wine, we're getting better with age. Well, we would hope so. <laughs> uh, Marty, I'm going to start first with the, uh, the first book, Radical Inclusion. Uh, you know, uh, in, in the military, we think a lot about the operating environment, sense making and that sort of thing. You spend a good deal of time talking at the beginning of the book about the operating environment and you focus on a couple of things. And one of them is the digital echo and the power of narratives. I'd like you to comment a little bit about that and then kind of how that's playing out in the ubiquity of the social media we know today. Yeah. Well, first, let me tell the 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 young men and women who are assembled to watch this, uh, thank, thank you in advance for what you, well, first of all, thanks for the decision you made 
And then thank you for what you'll do for your country as, as we go forward. And I mention that because I, uh, I, because I genuinely admire what the Coast Guard does, but also because I think your task will be harder than it was for Admiral Allen and I and, and our peers in our generation. And the reason it'll be harder is exactly what Admiral Allen said, is this idea that we live in an era where information moves faster, it tends to gain complexity as it moves, where leaders are under intense scrutiny as a result, and where narratives often matter, uh, matter more than facts. And I, 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 let me highlight that last point a bit. I mean, facts are still important. The question is they're a little harder to settle in on. They're a little more fragile than, for example, when um, when uh, Disraeli famously said, you know, facts are stubborn things, uh, they're not so stubborn anymore. There, there's a lot of things competing with them. And what competes with them are these narratives, which are, are easier to absorb. They tend to move more quickly because they move from individual to individual. And uh, they're more entertaining. And so back to our point here today, in terms of your ability to lead, uh, to, which is another way of saying your ability to influence those entrusted to your care. I think you have to re remain aware that you're in a competition for the attention and for the trust of those who will agree to follow you. In other words, you're going to have to be in that competition to use influence more than authority because of all the different competitions that the, the young men and women who who sign up to follow you are being subjected to. I, you know, look, it, uh, the digital echo is neutral. It can be used for noble purposes like the ice bucket challenge, you know, where, where people raise tens and thousands and hundreds of thousands of dollars for ALS. And it can be used by for nefarious purposes like spreading the ISIS ideology. So the echo itself is neutral. Uh, you just have to be aware that it's out there and, and make sure that part of your leadership commitment is to be part of that competition in a positive way. Yeah, there's obviously some tension between facts and knowledge and the narratives. And you don't always control the narrative once it gets out there into the wild, as you, as you noted. Uh, what, did you, what, what do you think is the best way a leader can approach how you actually manage that tension? By being a sense maker, you know, I'm not sure when you uh, when you and I were growing up uh, in you in the Coast Guard, me in the Army, Thad. The, uh, I don't remember anyone telling me that one of the important leadership attributes was to be a sense maker. You know, it was more about accomplishing the mission. Uh, it was more about explaining objectives, but not necessarily explaining the rationale for how we're going to get there. You know, there were just uh, there were just more things that. Uh, we were supposed to take at face value and not and not and not question. Now I think we live in a in a, an environment where you know the, these narratives uh, create competing realities and and I, I think it's important for leaders at every level to be a set, be, help those that follow them be you know make sense of things in, in a way that it was it was always important before it just wasn't as imminent and urgent. Uh, or imperative. And so I think being a sense maker is really important. Now to do that, you got to build knowledge at a, at a more rapid and a, a rate maybe than you and I had to build it. You got to be able to reflect on your experiences and translate those to the people who follow you. And I, and I think importantly, you got to be known as someone who is worthy of being trusted. So your character really matters. I'd like to zero in on one part of that, and that's the uh, radical inclusion. It, when, in developing the narrative, you know, it can't be monotone. It's got to be many voices uh, reflecting a sense of belonging. So I wonder if you could comment on not only the concept of radical inclusion, but in both books, you spend a lot of time talking about belonging. Yeah, I, I mean, one of the, the, I think the most fundamental human instinct is to to want to belong to something, especially at a time like now when, you know, think about the three different crises that are so evident in our lives right now. The, the pandemic, economic repression or whatever the economists choose to call it. And, you know, the renewal of racial tension based on things that have been deferred for far too long in our society. 
all of them produce the same emotion, which is fear. You know, if you're, you're fearful that you or your family members or someone you love is going to catch the COVID-19, you're, we're all a bit fearful about what the economic situation will be that has resulted from the pandemic and how are we ever going to, you know, find the money as a nation and get our GDP cranking again. And, and if you're a high school senior, you know, am I going to have a job when I graduate? And then, you know, in terms of race, it's, I mean, think about this, that I, there's probably, I, I, it's probably not half, but I'll use half illustratively. Half the people in the world, not in the world, half the people in our country are fearful that nothing will change, especially men and women of color are, are fearful that despite all of these recent um, issues that nothing will really change. We're gonna be living with this again and again and again. So they're fearful that nothing will change. And then there's a part of the population that are fearful that everything will change, You know that the country will slip into socialism or whatever the, the latest fear of the day is. But the point is it's fear. And you know I, I think that it's one of those times in our history where besides being sense makers, leaders, really need to understand that people are desperate to feel a sense of belonging and they really want to trust something and someone. Well, I, I, I think in that environment, there's, re there's real opportunity for young men and women of you know, knowledge, experience and character to be the kind of leaders we want them to be. The other thing about radical inclusion, it seems to me is that, you know, when you and I were serving together, um, I, I sensed, you know, as the calendar began to turn in 2014, that there were so many challenges facing our country. You know, we, we'd gone from just focused on terrorism and probably, you know, uh, uh, transnational organized crime in the Southern Hemisphere. Those were probably the two real threats that we sensed from a national security perspective. And in 2014, we decide, not we decide, but we have to add a, uh, a revanchist Russia, you know, in the Crimea and in Ukraine, China beginning to poke at the South China Sea, Iran acting out, you know, to improve its negotiating position in the, in the joint program, uh, comprehensive program of agreement, but also, you know, sponsoring surrogates in, the, in Syria and in Lebanon and all the way over to Yemen. And then North Korea, Kim Jong-un beginning to really become aggressive with ballistic missile and nuclear research. All of this happened literally in, in one calendar year. And my, my sense was that our immediate impulse, less so in the Obama administration than afterwards, was to, oh, we got to regain control. We, we got to control this situation. And, and as you know, we did it by taking on a lot of these issues ourselves. And the cost of control is absolutely, you know, unsustainable, number one. Secondly, when you try to do everything yourself, you're not gaining the knowledge that you can gain if you're more inclusive. You know, we're in, the, we're in Europe, we're in the Middle East, we're in Pacific, you know, we're where the Coast Guard is, both because we think we should be to protect our interests, but also to gain the knowledge we can gain from allies and partners by being out and about where we can gain their assistance in understanding the environment. That's so pragmatically, I mean, idealistically, I really believe in inclusion. I just feel like that's our country. But setting aside my idealistic impulse, I also think there's some real pragmatic reasons to, to seek to be more inclusive. And they include knowledge, they include ownership, they include shared resources. And ultimately, if you accomplish something with a group, an inclusive group, it's going to stick. It's going to last more than it will if you decide you got to do it yourself. Yeah, you just commented, I would say, taking inclusion to scale globally. And I remember the conversations going on about the force levels in Afghanistan and the extraordinary difficult uh, analytical process we had to go through. Yeah. But the multilateral solution uh, was to make this a NATO force. And uh, I, th I think you've done a good job of talking about inclusion as, as you discuss it in the, in the first book. Uh, but in the context of the world we live in now, uh, what, what is your view of multilateralism? Well, you and I grew up, and this is a reflection of our generation for those of two generations or so behind us. You and I grew up in a world, 
in the post-World War II period where the country made a conscious decision to enter into these alliances and partnership with, I think the number is still 53 other countries in the world, so that we would, we would um, support each other in the common defense. And NATO is the biggest, but it stretches all the way over into the Pacific, as you well know. And we made a deliberate decision that we would do that so that we could lead the world and lead it by being part of it. And we made the decision that, you know, in, in the nuclear era, we're still in the nuclear era, but if you remember, you remember the 50s and 60s, you know, the, the threat of nuclear conflict was really high. We, we believed that building these alliances and partnerships would send a signal to our potential adversaries that they're not just taking on the United States or one country, they're taking on the world if they choose to do that. I still think that's the world that I live in and, and that we live in. Um, we've taken some decisions lately to, to try to do things more by ourselves. And those are the kind of decisions that we elect people to make. But I, I've always been pretty cautious about that because again, I, I think when you, when you decide to go it alone, you then lack the knowledge you would benefit from. You, you don't share ownership. You pretty much own the entire thing. And I don't think uh, it, it sticks as well because people, you know, no one but us is really committed to it. So I, I am a globalist. I know that, I, you know, that that can be considered a pejorative term sometimes. I also am, you know, clear eyed about the problems that creates and, you know, and telling Congress why we need to spend a billion dollars in Afghanistan when, you know, the roads and bridges in West Virginia are falling apart. I, I believe me, I, I, I'm not suggesting it's a you know, it's, a, uh, it's an easy decision to make to be inclusive and global. Um, and I don't think it has to be, you know, I don't think uh, it has to be mutually exclusive or, you know, I think sometimes people build a false dichotomy and say, well, you know, if we're gonna be global, we can't really worry about ourselves at home. That's not true. I think it's a matter of finding that sweet spot where we can accomplish uh, the task to shape the world in an image that we think would be favorable to us and to our values while well, at the same time working at home, but we got to have that dialogue. Yeah, I'd like to take it micro now after talking about the problems you know, in, the, in the larger world. Um, you're very eloquent in both books about talking about uh, creating a sense of trust and belonging in organizations. Um, my father-in-law was part of the 101st Cavalry in World War II. Right. Uh, not in advance in Normandy doing contact with the enemy. You talk a lot about that. Uh, I thought you had a rather brilliant uh, statement at the end, uh, trying to bring everybody together and create unity of purpose and a narrative. Uh, you said, we all are scouts. Can you explain that a little bit? I'd like you to tell that story. Yeah, well, let me start by saying I, I got the idea, actually, from, believe it or not, from the movie City Slickers, where, you know, Curly, the, I think Jack Palance is the actor, is talking to Billy Crystal. Billy Crystal is having a midlife crisis trying to figure figure out who he is and why he is. And, and he, he asks Jack Palance, the, the character of Curly on a, on a, a trail ride, you know, uh, how do I figure all this out? And Jack Palance, you know, kind of uh, thoughtfully turns to him with a crooked finger and says, you have, to under, you have to figure out what's the one thing, you know, what is the one thing in your life that you value the most? And then, you know, figure that out and then, and then build on it. Well, when I took command of this, I think it was roughly 5,200 man and women organization, you know, that was intended to be the eyes and ears of the army as a scouting organization out in front. And what I found was that internal to the organization, you know, they, they all knew they were part of the same regiment, but they didn't all feel like they equally belonged. In other words, you know, the the helicopter pilots felt that they were more important than the ground scouts and the ground scouts certainly felt like they were more important than the, the supply train and the logisticians and the logisticians felt that they were more important than the people who put together the communications architecture. And so I was kind of trying to figure out how do I, how do I take a big organization like that and let and convince them that, you know, not only do we all belong to the same organization, but all of our contributions matter. And, you know, if one part of the organization fails, we all fail. And then it occurred to me that the mission of a cavalry regiment on the ground 
to be out in front of the rest of the core, in our case, is to be the eyes and ears, to be the scouts. We were all scouts. And so I started a campaign of making people, I'd go up to him and I'd, you know, I'd go to the motor pool and talk to a mechanic and I say, you know, he'd have a wrench in his hand and a toolbox. And I'd say, well, what do you do in this organization? And he'd say, well, I'm a mechanic. And I said, no, you're not a mechanic. And eventually, you know, you're a scout. We're all scouts. We all got, we're all, you know, we got 5,200 sets of eyes and ears and we all, we're all doing the same thing. You know, you might be fixing the tank, but you're fixing that tank so that it can be out in front, figuring out what's going on. And it really stuck. You know, I keep using that phrase, you know, stick. there's a book called Make It Stick. That's a really good book. And I can't remember now for the life of me who wrote it, but it talks about how to form a narrative that is both persuasive, which is important, but that actually lasts. And this idea of we're all scouts turned out to be important in bringing everyone together you know, to be part of one single organization, but also to help them understand uh, that that's their raison d'etre, that's their contribution, you know, long-term for as long as there's a cavalry regiment. And it just happened to work for me. Let me uh, shift topic here just a little bit. Uh, in, in your first book, you, you have the concept of learn to imagine. Yeah. We do a lot of conversation at the Coast Guard Academy. We talk a lot about emotional intelligence, empathy, and a lifelong learning. Yeah, uh, You are well aware from our earlier conversations. Uh, I had the ability to detail a Coast Guard captain to the uh, Commander's Action Group, uh, Sam Neill. And you talk a little bit in your book about emotional <laughs> intelligence, lifelong learning, and taking time to acquire knowledge. Can you repeat that story for the cadets, please? Yeah, I sure can. By the way, Sam Neill to this day remains one of my personal heroes. And although he was junior to me. I think he retired as a commander, you know, and I was the chairman with the shiny four stars on my shoulders. Um, he was a mentor to me then and now. We, we still are very close and very much in touch with each other. Um, what I did was, as part of my transition from going, uh, from being the chief staff of the army to the chairman, I, it, it just, I could tell right away that it was going to be a very different job. And that I hadn't really accumulated the kinds of experience and knowledge. I mean, I had some of it, but I knew I was that there were going to be gaps because now you're just not worried about building or deploying an army. Now it's the entire joint force. And it's in the context of all the other things that the president of the United States has to worry about. So I, Sam had just retired and I asked him if he would join my well, I get, yeah, he had just, or he was expressing that he was going to retire. And I asked him if he'd stay with me as a, as an SES and be my, uh, I called him my director of my campaign of learning. I, I gave it a name and I had two individuals, him and a guy named Jim Baker. And their job was literally to do, to, to find opportunities for me to learn something about, you know, that I was completely unaware of before so that I continued to, to build that basis of knowledge um, in, in case we ran into something. Now we started of course with cyber and, and cyber security. I, you know, I went out to the West Coast and visited all of, at, at, the, you know, at the instigation of Sam and Jim. We went out there, went to Google. We, you know, we went to visit cyber security, a guy named Steve Mandia. And, um, and it really opened my eyes to at the very beginning of the DOD getting serious about cyber and then we they had the chairman of the fed come over and you know ben bernanke and he came over to talk to me about um the the eurozone and what would the impact be of a of a collapse of the eurozone the euro itself on on our our military presence in europe and and then uh laurie garrett who may or may not be known to you who wrote a book called the coming pandemic i mean sorry the coming plague uh, and this was just literally just before the Ebola crisis of 2014. And she came over and, and Sam assembled a group from the National Institute of Health and the Center for Disease Control, the World Health Organization. And they sat there scaring the hell out of me, frankly, about pandemics, because it was their judgment that not only was the one coming in our immediate future, but this would be a cycle because of urbanization and the growth of the, you know, the world population and the ability of people to travel more easily, this was gonna be an issue. And sure enough, you know, it turned out to be an issue, 
but I was much better prepared to be able to give the president advice. The important thing about this campaign of learning was I, I did hire Sam to do it. And he was exactly the right guy because he had real bandwidth and he had all kinds of connections around the country. But also I gave him a seat at the calendar scrub. And, and Thad, you'll appreciate this. You know, when the, when the group of five or six people are making up the commandant's schedule or the chairman's schedule, it's a show. I mean, it's a fight. And if you don't have a seat at that table, you, you know, it, it ain't going to be on a calendar. And if it's not on a calendar, you're not going to do it. And so what Sam was able to do, because I gave him the authority, was speak with equal voice with the J-5 and with the J-3 and with the J-8 and with my executive officer in order to argue for time on the calendar. And then he tried to nest it in, you know, if I was going to the West Coast or something else, he tried to nest something into that. But sometimes they were discrete events. And I think we did something, I think our goal was every two weeks. I think realistically it ended up becoming about every three, but we did a lot to keep this idea of learning alive uh, when, while I was chairman. Yeah, I have to give Sam kudos. He did that for me too. You know, the most valuable currency we have uh, is our time. Yeah. Uh, I've got a couple of questions that the Corps of Cadets uh, submitted. Marty, I'd like to go over them with you if you don't mind. Sure, yeah. Um, what was the most important leadership lesson you learned at West Point? And I'm going to have a follow-on question to that, but go ahead. Yeah. Well, <clears throat> I, I think, you know, the, the thing that I remember most is that idea of how important it is as a leader and a follower to lead a felt life. In other words, you know, don't just go through the mechanics or the motions or the process of living, but you really have to force yourself to, to give some thought to what's happening around you. What, you know, what just happened and what does it mean? How does it fit into everything else? And, you know, that, and there, there's all these moments that come and go. And if you don't take the time to, you know, not only to process them intellectually, but to feel them, you're missing half of it. And, and I, I found that to be an extraordinary uh, lesson. One that, by the way, I, you know, if you were to really pin me down and say, well, okay, really, what does it mean to lead a felt life? I couldn't tell you. I mean, I could tell you how I did it and why I did it, but I really couldn't give you a checklist of attributes that help you do it. I think it's so personal, but I do think the, you know, kind of the encouragement to lead a felt life is valid, completely valid. The second thing was I learned to hold intention ideas where, where two things were equally important. And I'll, let's take the issue of loyalty. When you get to West Point or the Coast Guard Academy or any, any of the academies or basic training, you know, or ROTC or whatever it is, one of the first things they, you know, we drill is the importance of the team. You know, it's good that you have individual accomplishments. We want you to compete individually, but we want you to compete in the context of what's good for your team, your squad, your ship, your, your wing, whatever it happens to be. And, and they, and they, you know, that becomes part of our, our being, our nature, our character, you know, the importance of team. And then they introduce the idea of an honor code and they say, Oh, by the way, if someone on your team violates the professional standard of honor and integrity and 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 right you not only should uh speak to them about it but there are circumstances where you should actually let the institution know and i thought well, wait a minute how does that bang into the this idea of team i thought i'm supposed to protect my team and so what i realized in that moment and afterwards is that these places like these academies who are responsible for you know, future leaders and followers in a profession intentionally put those two values, if you will, in tension with each other, intentionally put them in tension so that we can better understand them and understand that, yes, loyalty is absolutely critical and important in our line of work, but it's not a one way street and it's not, you know, immutable. There are times when your loyalty to the team will be challenged by your professional ethic. And in those moments, you have to figure that out. And, and I don't know that there's any other way to actually learn that until you find those things put in tension with each other. Well, you, you make two very clear statements. I really, I really appreciate it reading the book. One is loyalty is not an entitlement and disagreement is not disloyalty. Right. 
I was also interested to see, later on in the book, you talk about, <laughs> again, this is another thing intention, be reasonably rebellious. And I was reminded of, uh, of the, the statement we all uh, heard lately with John Lewis, and that's getting into good trouble. Could you talk a little bit about how managing those two different distinct areas about being yeah. rebellious, uh, skeptic, uh, knowing moments of clarity when you see them, and then this notion of loyalty and teamwork? I will. I, you know, f so let's take the, the two chapters that are juxtaposed with each other. One is this idea of, you know, it, you should you should be sensibly skeptical. And then the other one is you should have a, a, a bit of an instinct for responsible rebelliousness. The, the idea of sensible skepticism comes almost full circle from what, where we started, which is in an era of ubiquitous information that competes with itself. Um, uh, you know, I just find I, 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 I speak with amazement to people who, you know, who take at face value something that they pull off of a website that in my judgment was clearly placed there to misinform, not to inform. And it happens on, you know, it happens across the political spectrum. It's not that, you know, only one group does this. And so the idea came to me about, you know, trying to encourage a bit of sensible skepticism, you know, as, a, as an instinct. And then I remembered back to our days together on the, as Joint Chiefs, where, you know, you remember, let's take Afghanistan. Every year we ask Afghanistan to, we ask the Central Intelligence Agency, the DIA, the, the Department of State, and the military leaders on the ground in the country to send us a review of the a campaign review. And you and I and others used to joke, well, we, we actually can pretty much you know, I can tell you what it's going to say even before it gets here. You know, the, the State Department, the, the CIA is going to say oh, all is lost, you know, which is no way we're going to prevail in Afghanistan. And part of that is, you know, they they are, you know, they're hardwired to get an A or an F. <coughs> you know, they don't get B's and C's in the intel community. And they're looking at the mission, you know, through the lens of, you know, local leaders, many of whom they deem to be corrupt and they're not confident that the central leadership of the country of Afghanistan will ever come together. And so generally speaking, their report is really pessimistic. And then the State Department is a little less pessimistic. And then you get the military report and we're hardwired to say, I, we can do this. You know, it's like the joke about the Irish plumber who goes to Niagara Falls and looks over the railing and says, I can fix this. Well, that's kind of the way the military is, right? I mean, we can do this. And it's not a bad thing to have that penchant. But, you know, the Joint Chiefs and then the chairman ultimately have to go across to the president who's looking for advice on Afghanistan and say to the president, yeah, we can or can't accomplish the mission and here's why. And, and then he, he reads the CIA report, he reads the State Department report, he's thinking, what, you know, how is it possible that the same people looking at the same problem are giving me such contradictory advice? And my answer was, that's absolutely what's going to happen 100% of the time. And then what has to happen after you get people to give their advice, you know, you don't ever try to shape their advice, as you well know. Once you get it, it's the responsibilities of leader, leaders at the center to make sense of it by being a little skeptical and, and you know, finding where that spot is, where you can actually um, figure out what's going on. And, you know, so it, 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 it's important, I think, today to be a little sensibly skeptical. You can't be cynical, but you, you can be skeptical. All right, responsible and, rebelliousness. Yeah, good. No, go ahead, please. <laughs> yeah, so responsible rebelliousness came out of the idea that as, uh, even while I was on active duty, but especially afterwards and you know, visiting corporations and sports franchises, you know, it was the realization that generally change occurs when someone innovates and innovation almost always requires you to push on the boundaries of it right i mean it just does if you don't push on the boundaries you're going to be inside that box and if you stay inside the box you're probably not going to innovate and so it it occurred to me that we ought to be able to find a way to articulate and encourage a little responsible rebelliousness and i make the the distinction that responsible rebelliousness is rebelliousness that occurs when someone is trying to accomplish, help accomplish the mission for the benefit of the team, not for themselves. They're not doing it for their self-aggrandizement. They're doing it because they see an opportunity 
that if taken will actually allow the team to accomplish its goals. That's why that's where it becomes responsible. I think it's personally irresponsible if it's done to be self-aggrandizing. Now, the reality is you're never going to two realities. One is <clears throat> nobody ever gets fired for failing to innovate. Think about it. You know, if you innovate, you're, you're a hero. If you don't, nobody says you're fired. They just don't. So the idea to try to help to find some middle ground was important to me. Secondly, you're not going to find that on an organizational chart of, of values. <clears throat> and what I mean by that is, you know, you go into these corporations and you say they want you to help with leadership and followership. And you say, well, let me see your corporate objectives. Let me see your corporate values. You're not going to find responsible rebelliousness. No CEO in his right mind is going to promote responsible or any kind of rebelliousness. But you can find it in the culture. You can find it baked in. And I think, and especially in our line of work, it's important to bake it in and to help people understand you know, the boundaries of it, but to understand that it's okay to be a little bit rebellious if you're trying to get the job done better. Thanks, I'm gonna throw you probably the toughest question we got from the cadets. It, was, okay. it, was, uh, it made me think quite a bit as well. I'll, I'll read it to make sure I've got it right. Okay. Uh, given that alcohol is so steeped in our social fabric, and junior military span the 18 to 22 year old range. What do you think is the best approach to making troops responsible with alcohol while also not encouraging unhealthy and inappropriate behaviors, including sexual assault? That's kind of a hard ball, but uh, let's see what you do with it there, Marty. Well, it is a hard ball. And it's one that I know you and I grappled with um, back in the day. And we grappled with it, not just because of crimes, which, you know, sexual assault is a crime and not just because of violations of our culture like sexual harassment, but with tragedies like suicide, which when you unpack all of those issues, there is often actually a substance abuse component to them. And, and so what alcohol does is, is that it, it exacerbates um, problems that already exist. Now, in some cases, it actually creates the problem. That's called alcoholism. But it, at the very least, it can exacerbate the problem. Now, having said that, um, it's almost like, you know, you remember there, and I won't use names, but there were some of our peers uh, in the military, senior leaders, who when the issue of suicide came up, wanted to make individuals who were gun owners, I'm talking about privately owned guns, wanted to make them uh, uh, store them, not in their homes, but in the arms rooms in our post camps and stations. And of course that ran afoul of second amendment rights and all kinds of things. But if you think about it, it's kind of the same issue. Do you try to take it away? And in so doing, you're probably infringing on someone's rights. Alcohol is legal, guns are legal. Or do you try to in, you know, um, build in knowledge and habits of better behavior with guns and or with things like alcohol? And I, you know, I don't think I don't necessarily think we move the we move the needle. I believe on in our on our watch uh, that um, I think the current leaders are equally trying to move the needle, and I think the next generation is going to have to figure out ways to move the needle. I personally believe that um, we you know we owe it to the young men and women who volunteer to serve their country, American sons and daughters. You know, we owe them the freedom to do things in their life that are legal for their peers. And so I would not be one who would be inclined to completely eliminate alcohol from the ranks because, you know, we find ourselves unable to deal with it. But I also think we should avoid, I think we should avoid um, circumstances where we glamorize it. You know, for example, I, look, I grew up in, a, in an army that was, first of all, it was a draft army. Secondly, it was a heavy drinking and smoking army and alcohol was glamorized. You know, there were rites of passage, you know, uh, carrier landings where you, I don't want to give anybody any ideas here, but where we would put, you know, big tables, you know, 10 foot long tables, put them together, soak them down in booze. And you remember this, and I think, and then, you know, the new Lieutenant would have to run and launch him or herself on the table and see if they could skid off the other end. I mean, how, you know, you, you wonder how we ended up, you know, as, as uh, first of all, as healthy as we did, but that, those were just things we did. 
I, you know, I think there's, I, you know, I'm, I'm a, I'm kind of an Aristotelian in that regard. I think, you know, I think things have to be approached in moderation as a profession. You know, we're not a fraternity, we're a profession. And so, uh, you know, I think it's all about moderation. And, and by the way, the last thing I'll say about this is with regard to alcohol is I, I'm not gonna sit here and tell you that I was this smart when I was that young. I, I was not this smart when I was, I'm not even smart now, but I can damn sure assure you I wasn't this smart when I was that young. And so what leaders and followers have to do is have this dialogue, help each other make sense of it, recognize that, uh, that you know, mistakes are gonna be made if, as long as they're not criminal mistakes, um, you know, I think we have to underwrite them, you know, so because pe people learn from failure more than they actually learn from success. And I think we have to bake in this idea of moderation so that we don't have people either willfully or negligently, you know, moving from one place on the spectrum to a place where we harm the profession, which we do with issues like sexual harassment and sexual assault. The real tragedy with them is of course that they're, that sexual assault is a crime, but the but the harm that we should internalize is what it does to our bond of trust with each other, and I think on that basis we have a better conversation with those inclined to go that route than we would otherwise. But people are going to do that, and we have to hold them accountable. Now let me uh, let me segue here a little bit. Uh... I've often said that one of the greatest things that ever happened to the Coast Guard Academy was the admission of women. Uh, we've been nothing but a better organization and enterprise since that happened. It's been civilizing, and you and I have talked about how things were in the old, way, old days. Uh, <clears throat> in your book, you talk about the decision to, about women in combat. Could mm -hmm. you discuss that a little bit with our, our cadets? Yeah, I can. Um, there was a point in time um, in pretty close proximity to you remember when, when we dealt, Chad, when I was the chief of the army, you were Coast Guard, and we dealt together as JCS with the issue of, of don't ask, don't tell. And I thought the real power in that issue, and then I'm gonna to come to the other one, was that clearly the president wanted us to take this on, the secretary of defense wanted us to take it on, but they were, but the president and secretary of defense were willing to hear our concerns and importantly, to give us time to do it right. You know, it wasn't one of these things where, you know, the Secretary of Defense just one day kind of said, I'm tired of waiting for you guys. Here it is, you know, don't ask, don't tell is rescinded. If you remember, I think they gave us a year and a half or so, and we sent uh, Carter Ham and Jay Johnson out to do a exhaustive study and a, a, kind of a listening tour really, and then came back. And we went through a process of trying to figure out how do we make sense of, back to this thing? We, how do you make sense of this for the force? And they gave us about nine months to do that. Some of it was, I think, pretty effective. The, the personal contacts were. The PowerPoint slides, I've never been convinced that made all that much difference. But the point is we had time to have a conversation with a million point two men and women so that when it was rescinded, you know, I'm telling you, it, it, I don't even remember anything except, oh, okay, we got that. But I don't think it would have been like that if, if it had been done the wrong way, which is to say by imposition or by authority, it was done by influence. Okay, let me talk about women in, in combat notably. First of all, the 1992 Les Aspen exclusion for women in combat by 2013, which is when we, we dealt with this, was an anachronism. I mean, you know, there were women in combat, deeply in combat, since certainly the Bosnia campaign. But actually, even back in, in Desert Storm, military police, men and women, and, you know, they were, they were, in some cases, they were out in front of us, for God's sake. So it was an anachronism, and we weren't being honest with ourselves. And so on that basis, we knew that we should rescind it. But we also knew that there'd be antibodies. And you know, one of the things about antibodies is you can, you can choose to ignore them or you can choose to deal with them. And we chose to deal with them. And the way we did that was once again, we, you know, the SECDEF, the, now it's a new SECDEF and a president said, um, you know, we want you, to, we want you to come and tell us why we can't do that. Now their position was more 
I would describe it as, I, I'll call it idealistic, although I, I share the idealism, which is in a volunteer force, anyone should be able to serve anywhere where they can meet the standards. That's kind of, that's kind of the underpinning of a volunteer force. If you can meet the standard, why wouldn't we let you serve in the position? So that, that's the one thing. But the other thing you remember we were dealing with is the reality that as a volunteer force over time, it was pragmatic that we needed women to be able to serve effectively and in, in, and in a welcome way in combat situation. Because, you know, only one out of four American men between eight, maybe less now, between the age of 18 and 22 can qualify for the military. And I'm sure it's true in the Coast Guard. It's either obesity or education or moral turpitude or whatever it happens to be, health. But it's harder and harder to actually fill the ranks. And so, if, you, if you're having trouble filling the ranks, why in the world would you not open more opportunities for women who can make it? That's the pragmatic side of it. And it's that side that we, we chose to, to balance the idealism and the, prag, and the pragmatics. And then the other important thing is we, we said, we're going to do this, but it's going to take time. And we got we, we to gotta review our standards. We're not going to lower them. I know that, by the way, I know there are people out there that say you lied to us, you're lower standards. No, we're not. We're not lowering standards. Um, we've had all kinds of women now make it through the toughest training in all the serve in each of the services. It's a volunteer force. So some of them, there's plenty of women that don't want to be an infantryman. By the way, I went into the armor corps tanks because I didn't want to walk to work and I didn't want to go to ranger school. I just, I didn't, I didn't want to do that. I wanted to be in tanks. And so, you know, people are saying, well, you don't have, you're not attracting enough women in the infantry. I say, well, that's probably, oh, that's probably right. But if they don't want to go, they don't have to go, you know, but, but when we find ones that want to go, they ought to be able to go. And I'm sure there's examples in the Coast Guard that fit that bill. So it's balancing idealism, which is if you can meet the standards of a position in our role volunteer force, you ought to be able to do it with the pragmatic reality that we need women in combat arms, we call it, to be able to serve in those specialties. Because over time, the demographics of the country is changing and it's not changing favorable to our recruiting effort. And so I say, let's do it. And it's gonna, by the way, it's gonna take 10 years. And we started it in 13, we're sitting here in 20. And in 13, I said, we'll sign this, but I guarantee you it's gonna be a challenge and we're not gonna really be satisfied with where we are for a decade. I had one female officer tell me uh, several years ago that uh, combat's the ultimate measure of citizenship. And uh, thanks for your eloquent uh, explanation of that. Uh, shift into a, a different line here regarding character and leading yourself and leading others. Uh, I was very, I was drawn to a statement you made in your, uh, in the second book where you talk about an accumulation of habits and uh, what you learn over a lifetime and how you aggregate that. It, it relates obviously to lifelong learning, um, but this notion of character and how you actually uh, conduct yourself, I thought that notion of accumulation of habits was very, very powerful concept. Could you talk about that? I can. There's two things about character. There's three, I mean, and I'll go through the first two qu quickly to get to your third. Look, we all walk around in life, let's, let's call it with three rucksacks one that's labeled knowledge, one that's labeled experience. You used a, a similar example before, but I, my personal way to think about this is I label my three rucksacks, knowledge, experience, and character. And you know we keep filling the knowledge rucksack and we keep filling the experience rucksack, but oftentimes we feel like the, the character rucksack is just, it's okay, we got it. You know, I, I, At one point I knew I had character, I must still have it. And that's really not true. You gotta keep filling that one too. And the way you fill it, is by thinking about the challenges you face in life and how do you make the decision? Is character a part of it? When the answer is yes, you've added to your rucksack. When the answer is no, I didn't actually think enough about how it impacted on character. And then you're taking something out. That's number one. Second, here's the thing for all of the young men and women listening. You'll go through life and there's really very little that you control yourself. I mean, literally yourself. But character is one of those things. You control your character. You, con uh, you control 100% of your character. You control what you do what you, and what you don't do. How you let character influence what you do and how you ignore it. And, 
And that's the second thing, you control your character. And then the third thing is, and this is why that accumulation word is important, Thad, because I don't want to sit here and tell anyone listening that I never made a mistake, uh, you know, and, and at times violated something that was, I thought, important in my character. Of course I did. I mean, I'm, I'm a flesh and blood human being like everyone else. So of course there were times when I didn't maybe live up to what I thought I should have lived up to. That's why you have to think of it as an accumulation, because if you think of it as, you know, one mistake and you're, you know, one swing and you're gone, or even as a baseball, you know, three strikes and you're out. If you think about it that way, there'd be a lot of us that say we're out. You know, I mean, it's just, it's just, I, I had my three strikes. I'm done. I'm not living up to it. So I got to go do something else. Look, once again, you, you know, unless you do something illegal or terribly unethical and immoral, this profession has an, a place for you to be less than you think you can be, but to learn from the experience. And that's why it's important, I think, to, let, to think about character as an accumulation of habits that build on each other and that support each other when, when you have tough decisions. And the, and the more senior you become, as you know, that, and as these you know, young men and women will figure out, the more senior you become, the tougher the questions become. You know, somebody else is peeling off all the easy ones long before they get to the chairman and the commandant of the Coast Guard. And so you have to build an accumulation of, of character to be ready for when those really tough decisions come. And let me slip back to the knowledge rucksack. Uh, you really kind of keyed something when you said that. Uh, I've often told folks that I'm talking to that the status quo is an oxymoron because the universe is expanding every microsecond. Um, you have an interesting conversation under your uh, sensible skepticism portion of your second book, uh, talking about latency of information. Uh, and there's, in my view, that creates a mandate for lifelong learning and always being curious because you don't know what you don't know. But can you go through your, uh, your anecdote about is, was, and gonna be? I thought yeah. that was pretty compelling. Yeah, it's a tactical example, but I do think it has, you know, strategic and even policy implications. And I'll, and I'll explain why. So the tactical example, I was a tank battalion commander. I had 54 tanks uh, broken out into four companies. And then I had a tank and my executive officer had a tank. And we were in a training environment in, in Germany at a place called um, Hohenfels. Many, many of you may know it. And basically the opposing force, which lives there right in the training center, they get pretty darn good at finding all the ways they can get into you and defeat you and get around you and and destroy your logistics behind you. They're actually world class, and and you want them to be. You you don't you know we always say make the scrimmage harder than the game, and so these group of soldiers acting as the opposing force, using Russian tactics back in the day, um, they were hard to beat. I mean really hard. On this one exercise though, I thought I had it figured out. You know I mean I I, I wasn't a commander that lacked confidence. I I tried to balance humility and and ambition and confidence. But I, I was pretty confident and we had arrayed ourselves such that I was pretty confident that I could kind of seduce the enemy into taking one route and then I could collapse on that enemy, you know, laterally. It sounded good to me. And in fact, we were, we were right where we needed to be. We had all the reports coming in that we needed to have come in. By the way, this is before drones and overhead imagery and all that. So it was all voice uh, coming into me. And at the appropriate moment, when I thought I had them, the enemy where I wanted them to be, I initiated the, the counter maneuver that would pin them in and allow me to destroy them. And about 30 minutes later, I got a report that the enemy was back in my, we call it the combat trains, the logistics tail, you know, eating my MREs. And I'm thinking, how in the heck, you know, I had everything exactly the way I wanted it. And, um, and yet I lost. And so I was feeling sorry for myself, I guess. And a helicopter hovers in and lands and a one-star general steps out of the helicopter and, and he'd been observing this and it was his job to kind of give me feedback. I would get plenty of it later too, but, I, but his job was kind of the immediate feedback. And he said, what do you think happened? And I said, I don't know, but I'm sure you're going to tell me. And he said, well, I will tell you. He said, you fell victim to is, was, going to be. And I said, General, I, I appreciate the feedback, but I, I don't have any idea what you're talking about. And he said, well, let me put it this way. Um, when you received that first report from that scout, 
that the enemy had taken the route you anticipated that they would take. You, what did you think that that, that was? And, and or what, you know, how would you characterize that information? I mean, were you characterizing it as kind of real time in the moment? We were like, right when you got it? And I said, yeah. I said, it's my scout. He picked up the radio and called me. And I said, yeah, but he said, yeah, but you know, that's a human being on the other end of that thing. And you know, he probably had a maneuver around a little bit to make sure he was right. He didn't want to give a bad report. You know, he's probably looking at the right format to get the report, you know, and he's fumbling, fumbling around and maybe the radio, you know, imagine this, the radio wasn't working exactly the way he wanted it to. And then eventually it gets through and he renders the report. And by now it's not is, it's was. And he said, you're getting a history lesson at that point. And he said, and by the way, that's not even what matters. What matters is what you really need is what's gonna be if you wanna get that enemy and, and, and defeat him. And I thought latency is the problem. Now you and I, I'm guessing that latency has been reduced as a potential problem for the young men and women in this session, you know, because we do have real time, you know, live streaming, real time video. We've got, I mean, we've got all kinds of capabilities that we didn't have before. But what we also have that they probably are more familiar with than you and I are at that are things like deep fakes, the ability to manipulate information, to actually change video. And if you think that our systems are completely immune to that, then you're kidding yourself. I mean, I think we're, we're learning as we go, but there is latency and there is misinformation. And that's where, and what this general was saying to me was, you as the leader have to apply your knowledge and experience because you've got more than that scout out there. And if you don't apply it, you know, all you're doing is reacting to the different reports along the way that are being rendered by people who know less than you do and have less experience. So he said, don't, don't discount that, but, you know, understand that information is just one part of your decision-making apparatus. It's also knowledge, experience, instinct, and character. And it was a great lesson for me. Thanks, Marty. I'm going to give you a, a final question. It more relates to the, uh, the current environment that uh, all the service academies and everybody in the military, actually any public servants dealing with right now. Uh, you know, it used to be you deployed, you're in a risk situation, you trained, you had standard operating procedures and so <laughs> forth. You came home, uh, you had some downtime, you had time to relax with your family. Uh, the way it's working right now is when you leave work, whether you're in the military or anything else, and you go home, you never leave the risk environment of this pandemic. Yeah. And it's a significant issue now because we're trying to sustain our ability to cope with this thing. And we don't know when we're going to run through the tape. Uh, there's no milepost along the way. There may be a vaccine. There may be this there may be that. But in the meantime, trying to manage the what I call the tyranny of the present, the day-to-day -day problem. And still try and understand when you made headway and where you ought to take something and institutionalize it because you have to change what you're doing in the face of not knowing when this is, ends is very, very mentally fatiguing and physically fatiguing for everybody. I just wondered if you had any thoughts on it, kind of observing the world we're all living in right now. Yeah, I, I have to tell you, I, of all the things that I would, if I were them, the, the graduating class of 2021 and beyond, of all the things that I would be excited about, it would be leading and helping the institution called the United States Coast Guard overcome that. And, and what I mean by that is, you know, you and I came in the military about the same time. And we came into the military at a time when we were transitioning out of Vietnam into what eventually became the Cold War. We were transitioning from a, a conscript draft force to an all volunteer force. Truly, we were just beginning to integrate the military, even though the order was signed in the late 40s, early 50s. I mean, we have to be honest with ourselves that integration really didn't occur until we had the all volunteer force and began to be more inclusive, not just diversify. And so I remember thinking to myself, wow, what have I gotten myself into? You know, I was getting ready to go to Vietnam, didn't have to go. I was getting ready to lead conscript soldiers in my case, didn't have that. I had to help help figure out, you know, what had to change to accommodate an all volunteer force. And I had to try to find a way to, to reduce the incidence of race. And by the way, drug, drug abuse in the military. And I, I found myself 
so engaged and excited about the opportunity to do something other than take what I was given and just run with it. You know, because if if we hadn't come out of Vietnam, if we hadn't changed to an all volunteer force, if we hadn't really taken on board the importance of, of, uh, of uh, integration, then it would have just been, you know, some commander will give you a checklist and say, hey, go down this checklist. You know, here's what you need to do. Go down this checklist. Well, we didn't have a checklist. And so I was able to, you were able to, our generation was able to help, <clears throat> help us figure out what did we need to do in those years to be better. And, and I really felt like I was empowered, even as a junior officer, to help you know, contribute to that dialogue. This generation has got the same thing. Here's the deal. The pandemic ain't going away anytime soon. I mean, I saw the Pfizer report this morning about 90% effective. I hope so, but I'm thinking it'll end up being more like 60 by the time the clinical trials are all done. And 10 to 20% of the population probably won't trust it enough to take it for a while. And so, you know, we know what managing risk at 100% risk looks like, because there is no vaccine yet. What's, what's it going to be like to manage risk at, at 40%? I love that question because, you know, we can't just say, well, we'll do the same thing. You know, we'll just keep ourselves isolated. We won't have spectators at football games. You know, the, we'll do everything in bubbles. And no, we're not. We can't live like that for, you know, the next 10 years. So what an opportunity to figure out how to manage risk at 40% um, instead of 100%. Same with the economy. Th these young men and women are going to have budget issues, such like we've not had for a while. And here's the, the thing about budget issues. Everybody hates them, but everybody has to admit the following. When you have less money, you have to think more. It's just a fact. And so victory will go to those young leaders who think, who, who instead of wringing their hands, roll up their sleeves. You can't do both at the same time. Roll up their sleeves and figure out how to do with what they've been given for the good of the country. And what a great opportunity. I mean, it's going to, sometimes it's going to feel like a pain in the you know what, but it's also got to be seen as an opportunity. And the same thing for race. If I was this group now, I'd say, okay, look, our, our forefathers, you know, you and me, unfortunately, got it to a point, but we didn't get it all the way. We got it to a point. And what are we going to do, meaning them, to get it the rest of the way? I love that challenge and I hope they take it on. And so, you know, here's, let me end, end this question by saying this. I hear a lot of people say, I can't wait till we get back to normal. And I say back, really? I don't think normal, I mean, normal was good. I was doing okay, but I don't think everybody was doing okay. And since not everybody was doing okay, maybe we can do better. And, and so if we can start talking about how to turn crisis into opportunity and disruption to destiny, um, and if we can, you know, find a way to not just get back to normal, but to create a better normal, I think, you know, that's a huge contribu contribution to our country. That's the contribution they, they, they'll have to make. And I, I, I hope they're really super excited about it. Yeah, Marty, I couldn't agree more with you. Uh, I passed on some words of wisdom to the last graduating class of the Coast Guard Academy. If you looked at the the greatest generation came out of the Great Depression and basically saved the world in World War II. Uh, we are poised to need a generation to be able to do that kind of thing to move this country forward. And I uh, thought your remarks were spot on there. Uh, if we were at the academy, uh, the regimental commander would offer you a, a speaker's gift. Uh, we're doing this virtually. Uh, and rather than me trying to imitate your extraordinary uh, singing talents, uh, we thought we'd offer you this from the Corps of Cadets. Of all the money that e'er I've had, I sent it in good company. And of all the harm that e'er I've done, alas,
Uh, Marty, that was the female corral at the Coast Guard Academy, the Fairwinds. And uh, we just want to thank you very much uh, for sharing this time with us and your extraordinary insight. Uh, and we're all uh, grateful for your collective wisdom that you've distributed here this evening. Uh, do you have any closing comments or thoughts you'd like to offer? Well, I, first of all, let me thank the Fair Winds. That was extraordinary. That's obviously one of my one of my favorite songs. And that is a gift. Sure beats a, a, a replica of an icebreaker, although I really do like icebreakers too. <laughs> and if we ever get up to, uh, if when this all kind of, uh, this pandemic and other challenges is, is uh, back to where we can manage a normal life or a new normal. Uh, I'd love to come up and see if I could join that corral group and, and maybe we can go viral on YouTube or something. So we'll do that. And then the last thing I'll, I'll say is, uh, I, I just wanna uh, say as we part company here that how much I admire these young men and women for coming to the Coast Guard Academy, for joining the Coast Guard, and which as you know, Dad, I, I always considered part of the joint force to the, to the point where um, Bob Pop, uh, Pop Pap let me put the Coast Guard symbol on the back of my chairman's coin, which I was very touched about when I became chairman. And I wanna wish them well, and I suppose the appropriate phrase would be fair winds and following seas. And thank you for the opportunity to speak with them today. Thank you, Marty, and good evening for everybody who was able to join us this evening. Pleasure to have you all. Greetings, U.S. Coast Guard Academy Corps of Cadets, CGA Community, U.S. Naval Institute, William M. Wood Foundation, and friends. I am Rear Admiral Bill Kelly, the 42nd Superintendent of the United States Coast Guard Academy. Thank you for joining us during our first virtual event with the U.S. Naval Institute. I would like to start off by thanking Vice Admiral Pete Daly from USNI and their events team, Ms. April Perico and Ms. Kelly Alto along with the William M. Wood Foundation for making this event possible tonight. The Admiral James M. Loy Institute for Leadership has partnered with USNI for five years. I am grateful for the Naval Institute's continued support to our academy and to the greater United States Coast Guard. USNI not only provides superior core-wide engagements, but they also sponsor an annual Proceedings Coast Guard Essay Contest. Congratulations to those winners, Lieutenant Commander Daniel Wiltshire, and Petty Officer Third Class, Merrill McGowan. And for our very own Bravo Company Officer, Lieutenant Andrew Ray, congratulations to all. I would like to conclude by thanking Admiral Allen and General Dempsey for their continued dedication to build leaders of character. And to our cadets, faculty, staff, coaches, and crew, thank you for submitting questions and enabling impactful and meaningful dialogue between General Dempsey and Admiral Allen. Our IT team has also deserves a round of applause for their hard work during this pandemic, maintaining our ever increasing virtual events. We are grateful to all of you who made this event a success. We hope you enjoyed this virtual event and we look forward to what's to come in 2021. Semper Paratus and forever, go Bears!